Hi, welcome to another edition of North Shore Journal. I'm your host, Walt Kosmowski, and I'd like to introduce my very special guests today. I have with me Megan O'Neill, who is the Executive Director of the Essex County Habitat for Humanity. Yes. Did I get that right? You Megan? got it totally, got, totally got, right. Well, I got that right. Thank you. And uh, Andrew DeFranza, who is the Executive Director of Harbor Light Community Partners here in Beverly. And um, Andrew, of course, has been a, a guest on my show a number of times. Uh, and, you know, Megan, I was talking to Megan the other day that I've been doing this show since about 2004, 2005, about 18 years, and you were one of my very, very first guests in a, in a different position that it's, you had back It's uh, good to be back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, <laughs> welcome back. You, you beat me to the punch. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I think our viewers could see by, by your organizations that what we're going to be talking about today is affordable housing. Uh, and we're going to be talking about uh, uh, that in general and uh, specifically about, about how your, your organizations uh, handle that mission. I mean, broadly stated, I think in the most general terms, you could say that your organizations help people with limited means to get affordable housing, meaning at less than market costs. I guess it, it, broadly stated, that would be your mission, but how you go about it is a little different. So. We're going to talk about uh, affordable housing in general and about your organizations and talk about some of your specific projects, if you will. So um, now, now you're both you're both nonprofits, correct? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, let me start with with, with you, Andrew. You, you're uh, Harbor Light. Actually, you own and manage the properties. T tell us how your model works, how you acquire properties and, 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 and the people live there and how, how you work with with your properties. Yeah, so we uh, we develop uh, our own properties and then we own them long term and manage them. Um, so that's generally what people know us for. We also do some interesting service models for particularly vulnerable populations and a lot of advocacy and public education work as well. But I think most people know the development and the management side. So we're always looking for uh, property all around the region. Um, we have a lot of projects going at the moment, yeah, uh, so we'll we're, about we're, some uh, of those, yeah. we're we probably are not taking anything new for a little while while yeah. we work those things out. Um, and most of that stuff is funded by the municipalities and the state and the federal government, along with local banks and investors uh, and the like. Um, yeah. And so the whole alchemy is you're trying to create a financing model where you can create a really good product, like the one just up the street from here, Anchor Point, uh, but uh, make it available to the users uh, who are going to find home there at a cost that's consistent with their income. Below, below market. So that's the that's the now, mojo. Do you end up paying market? I mean, I'm, I'm sure that there are developers all over looking for properties just mm -hmm. like yours. So do you end up having to compete on a, on a price basis with these folks as well? So you don't get any discount or anything because of who you are? We, we can. It's, it, occasionally somebody will help us, like we're working on a project in Rowley now where uh, the landowner is donating the land for the purpose, which is pretty exciting. Mm -hmm. um, but oftentimes we're paying market rate for the parcels. Mm -hmm. um, best case scenario though for us is we get a seller who is interested in what we're doing or otherwise the project and they help us with time. So yeah. time is the bigger problem in that we want to hold land for an extended period of time to permit and finance it. Uh, and so sometimes people will give us a long-term option, five years or more, and that's very helpful. Yeah. Uh, but on price, we're generally market. Where we don't compete well is on if we have to be fast and pay market. That's much more difficult yeah, to do. We yeah. generally just don't do that. And, and from what you said before, you, you, you usually forms, if I can call it, like a consortium of, of lenders, buyers. So, so it's not just like one one pot or no. one, uh, you know, one entity putting up the financing. I know that w with Anchor Point that we'll talk about in a, in a, in a minute, there, there must have been, what, six or seven different... different yeah, like 10 to 12 different 10 to sources, 12 different yeah. uh, financing sources. So, yeah. yeah. And, and Megan, let, let's talk about your, your financial model. Now, you're, you're a little bit different. Uh, let, let's back up a little bit. Uh, Andrew buys these properties and, and, and people actually pay you rent, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, in your case, you, you 
buy the properties, rehab them, and then the people actually own them, correct? Yeah. So t tell us, how, how do you find the properties? How do you buy them? Yeah. Uh, and and uh, uh, give us your financial model or your operating model. <laughs> yeah. So like Andrew, our um, method of acquiring properties really varies. So best for us is when they are donated. And sometimes there are churches or banks or individuals who may be interested in doing that. So that is our first best choice for the property. Um, sometimes we're able to work with a local municipality who's interested in developing affordable housing and has some surplus property. So that's another way that we acquire property. And sometimes we are buying property at market rate or a little bit below if there is and like Andrew, sometimes the, the timing can take us a while to put that together. So um, having a seller who has some interest in the work we're doing is always helpful for yeah, us. Yeah, yeah. And, and again, how, now how, do you, how do you get your money? How do you get your financing? Yeah, so ours is a little bit simpler. We don't have 12 sources for our projects generally. Um, the funding stream, so we, the, the biggest source of funding is contributed income. So charitable gifts to Habitat are our biggest source of income. Um, second would be um, the mortgage that the homeowners pay. So the, the homeowners don't pay market rate for their home. Our homes on average cost about $200,000. So Habitat does get some money from the sale of homes, not enough to cover the cost of building the home, but that is a second source of income. And then we operate a restore, which is a thrift store that sells right. used appliances and furniture right. in Lawrence. And the proceeds from that help to fund our work as well. Yeah. Um, now, your Habitat for Humanity, I, I know Andrew is, you're, you're a, a, a nonprofit, you're, you're based in Beverly and you're, a, you're one organization, but now tell us a little bit about Habitat. Uh, some of the folks might not uh, know this, but there are, your Habitat of Essex County, right, but there are other Habitats and this, I think that the original Habitat for Humanity was, was started by, by a, a, a husband-wife team yes. about I don't know, 40, 50, about 50 years ago or so. Tell, yeah, can yeah, you tell us about yeah. that? So the original Habitat for Humanity model came out of Georgia um, in 1976. But Habitat in this region was formed in 1985. We're a nonprofit organization with a local board of directors um, and uh, entirely self-funded locally and locally governed. So um, we do have a relationship with Habitat International. We follow some guidelines that they set. Mm -hmm. um, we support some of their international work as well, but we're a, a local organization. Yeah. But you do get you do get the the publicity uh, off of, of what Habitat does, and I know that one of your big spokespersons and the, probably the most visible Habitat, you know what yeah, I'm going to say, yeah. the Habitat for Humanity uh, folks that represent you is former President uh, Jimmy Carter, who I yeah. think he just celebrated his 96 or 90 something like yeah. that, high 90s yeah. birthday. So he's a he's a visible. He's been doing it for decades, uh, yes. actually out there with the hammers and saws and whatever. I don't know if he still do, do, does that, I, but I think at COVID, he stopped being able to get out there with, yeah. the, with the hammer and saw. And I think, yeah. he, you're, as you're saying, he's but, in his mid-90s at yeah. this point, so no yeah. longer out there building with us, yeah. but has been a very effective spokesperson and um, advocate for the work that Habitat does for many years. Yeah, yeah. So let's uh, let's talk a little bit about, uh, Andrew, uh, the project you had mentioned, it, which is just really right next door to the school here where we're sitting in the studio, mm -hmm. uh, Anchor Point. Uh, which is right at the corner of, of uh, uh, Tozer and Brimble. So uh, that is, uh, tell us about where, where we stand. I know the first phase has been done, and I think we have an image here where there was like a grand opening. In fact, this image is courtesy of our own uh, Matt Greenberg. <laughs> uh, and uh, this is, uh, tell us about what's happening at Anchor Point, phase one, and what's mm -hmm. happening. Uh, here, here, this is, tell us what happened here. What's yeah, going? that's a pretty good picture. Yeah, it's one of my favorites. So there's uh, so phase one is 38 uh, homes in a single building, two and three bedroom homes evenly. Um, that picture you see right there is the grand opening ribbon cutting, and those are uh, a, sem uh, a sample of all of the supporters of the project, the lenders, the investors, the donors, um, different contractors, and they're standing in the playground. So there's a pretty cool playground right next to the building that's getting a lot of use now and those folks are all are all standing there for a celebration photo there'll be a couple more phases uh... to this project so the second phase of the residential building is thirty nine units it's okay. a building that'll be right next door mm -hmm. um, to it uh... closer to the high school 
and that'll go into construction probably late next summer, uh, summer of 23. Phase one is in the process now being occupied. It's about half full. Okay. Um, there's a lot of uh, required paperwork processes with the funders, particularly at the state level and the federal level, so it takes a little while to lease it up. Um, yeah. But it should be fully occupied by the end of this year. Yeah. Um, and then we'll, as I said, we'll go into starting to build the second phase uh, in the summer of 23, and then that'll be getting occupied toward the end of 24. Uh, the third phase is a building called the Lighthouse Center, which is not funded um, by uh, public funds, but is philanthropically funded. Um, that's about an eight and a half million dollar project to build essentially a community center for the residents of that building. Uh, so it'll house a daycare on site, uh, community gardens, outdoor activity spaces, after school programming space, adult education space. And so we're in the process of raising philanthropic capital for that now. We've raised about 2.4 million so far. Mm -hmm. um, so we're we're talking. And to what's the date community. on the startup of that? Uh, well, so as soon as we have enough have uh, funding, funding. Um, ideally we would build that at the same time as phase two. Yeah. So about now, a year from Andrew, now. is that a new kind of concept by providing services as well as the as well as the places to live, but providing services as well? It's something that is that something you you uh, um, Initiated, or was that something that you that you've seen done in other places? Yeah, we've seen it done in other places. This is certainly an evolution of that model locally. So we've we've and locally we had done um, affordable residential housing. So essentially, make the housing economically accessible, and then on top of that, run a service model that would be particularly relevant to the population in the building. So Harbor Lighthouse, which is our oldest building from the '60s downtown, next to the fire station, is sort of the seminal spot yeah. for that, the seminal idea, which was affordable housing and then 24-hour care for seniors, and it's wildly effective, very humane, um, uh, efficient from a taxpaying standpoint, yeah. um, really good quality uh, for the residents, good quality of life. And so that fit a senior population. There was home health care aids there, there's meals there, activities, transportation, um, access to all sorts of things in that model. We took that model and riffed on it and built Boston Street Crossing about five years ago, which is in Salem, for homeless individuals. Same idea, though, affordable housing, and on top of that, services that would help homeless individuals regain and maintain their independence. Also very, very effective with that special population. So this is our first um, attempt at growing the model to be responsive to families. Yeah. And so when we were cooking that up, the idea was, well, what do families need in proximity right. and accessible to them that will help them, um, especially their children, as they're accessing opportunities in the community for their long-term success. And yeah. so that was education, um, growth in, in job type and income levels, support system for families, right. especially right. with child care. And so we tried to, we're trying to push all that into the site Wonderful. Uh, and say, okay, how do we, how do we maximize the chances of yeah. long-term success yeah. for Fantastic. people that are growing? Yeah. up here. Now, um, you mentioned uh, the, the first is what, 39 units, did you say? 38 units 38, in the first phase. And then another phase of, of approximately the same. Now, how, I'm sure that there's more people wanting places to live than you than, than there are in that. So how do you go about yeah. uh, choosing people? That, uh, do they have to file applications? And, and what's your process, Andrew? Yeah, so it's that we had about 650 applications for yeah. that 38 units. Um, so that can be pretty, you know, it can be a little heart wrenching because you have a lot of people who need and want the units. Um, and so the way that that works, it's a little bit complex, but we have to file a plan with the state that delineates how a lottery would work. Mm -hmm. And there are various preferences um, inside uh, of the building. So there's, for example, there are ADA units where there's a preference for people who need that. There was a local preference in this case, which was regional, Salem, um, Peabody, Beverly, and so those folks got uh, special treatment and access. Um, and then there were some other uh, preferences yeah. in the deal based on income. So you widely market this based on the plan that you give to the state, and then people apply, 650 of them, and then you screen for eligibility off of that, and then there's uh, of the eligible applicants, you then do an, a literal lottery. So yeah. we did it at the library. There was about 100 people in the room and another 100 on Zoom. It's yeah. pretty rare. We almost have no one show up for lotteries. Um, <laughs> so I actually drew the numbers myself. We drew them out of the jar, and there's a room full of people there watching. Yeah. And I, had, I had people in the front row you know, starting to call out, pick my pick 50 cents, <laughs> you know, pick the number, and, um, and then that goes in order, and yeah. then that's how you do it. 
Now, now, Megan, tell us about now your process. I, it, it, it's similar to what, what Andrew just described? Similar in some ways, but um, has some additional steps involved. Yeah, so t tell us about that. We yeah. also have to um, submit a plan to the state that is a fair process that markets the, the homes that are available. In our case, the next project that we're going to be starting is in Hamilton. And so that will be 10 homes, but for phase one, it is four homes, two two-bedroom and two three-bedroom homes. Um, and for those four homes, we had 39 families apply. Mm -hmm. um, so from there, we add in an additional step. In addition to checking their income, um, we also need to make sure that the families will have an ability to pay a 30-year mortgage. So it's an affordable mortgage, but we need to make sure that they show a consistent history of payment um, okay. because they will have a, a mortgage with a local bank. Um, we also need to check for need for housing. So if someone has perfectly lovely housing now that's affordable to them, they don't qualify for a Habitat home. And then they need to be willing to partner with us. So for Habitat homes, our families actually help build the home that they're going to yeah. live in. Yeah. And so we need to make sure that they understand that that is, they do between 240 and 360 hours um, actually working to help build their home. So we need to make sure that they have thought through that time commitment and are willing. They don't need any skills. We'll teach them everything they need to yeah. know. Um, but we need to make sure that, that that's going to be a, a fit for them. And then we do a lottery process similar to what Andrew described, um, where we actually, I, I did it on Zoom as well, draw, draw the numbers <laughs> out of the hat and call out, you know, here's, here's the, the, for the most recent one we did. Yeah. Um, so that's the similar process. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, what was I going to say? The, um, um, well, let me, let me, let me talk about uh, another project that, that, uh, and we're going to get back to the Hamilton, okay. the, the Hamilton project. Great. Um, well, let me let me let me let me say this: that that the, the people then have to put in what what I would call sweat equity, right? Yes. So they're they're actually yep. they're actually building alongside, and you you do have um, 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 suppliers that 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 donate supplies, yeah. um, appliances, and, and, and building materials as well, uh, yeah. I understand. So um, when we talk about cont contributions being our biggest source of donation, um, in sometimes, some cases that's cash donations that help us purchase things that we need, whether that's the site work or the land or um, different resources that we actually have to pay cash for. In other cases, um, there are donors, actually Coastal Windows based in Beverly, Coastal right. Roofing, yeah. um, has donated some roofs to our homes. So in some cases, it's the shingles and the labor that they donate. Um, in other cases, like Whirlpool is a supplier nationally. They give to every Habitat home a dishwasher and a refrigerator. And yeah. so so um, we cobble together <laughs> donations of building materials as well as the, the actual cash donations that we yeah. need to do our projects. Well, and we're going to get back to your project in a second. But yep. uh, let me let me touch on another project, which again is on the other side of the high school, just about a, a block away, uh, which is the old Briscoe uh, Middle School, mm -hmm. um, and um, that's supposed to be called the Beverly Village. Or living in the art, uh, uh, and that's a project that you're involved with, and you have a partner in that project. Uh, and and uh, I, I think the latest I read is that that project has been delayed a little bit because of costs and materials and stuff. Tell us a little bit about where that stands, Andrew. Yeah, mostly really good news for that one. So we're doing that project with Beacon Communities, which is a, a company out of Boston. Um, it's 91 apartments, mm -hmm. 85 for seniors and six for artists. Um, as with most projects in the state, there was a lot of turbulence based on interest rate and construction costs. Uh, and so we had some gaps uh, which have now been patched. So we had the, the city uh, very graciously through the Community Preservation Committee and then the city council uh, approved some additional funding and then the state, um, based on that participation, approved a significant amount of additional capital. Uh, and so that made us enough um, enough capital available that the project is going forward. So we're in the closing process now with the state, which can take 10 to 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. um, but the right now the expectation is that that would close in November, and construction would start pretty quickly after. After that, and we do have an image here. This is an artist's rendering of what uh, 
we can look at that. And that's more than just, again, uh, residences, because that's, that's a uh, village and living for the arts. Tell us, and you're, there's going to be an auditorium in there, an arts mm -hmm. space. Tell us a little bit about that aspect of it, Andrew. Yeah, so there are six apartments for um, live work apartments for artists uh, in the back, sort of in the back uh, locker room area for people who know the building. Uh, and so that was a big, a big feature of it. The city is going to maintain ownership uh, of the front, uh, what's known as the turf bowl, which is what you see there, um, which will be a nice little public park, as well as the soccer field in the rear. Uh, and then the theater, um, which is in the front, uh, is going to be maintained and restored. We're not sure yet who the operator will be. COVID put a little bit of a wrinkle into theaters. Uh, yeah. uh, and so we're, uh, we're talking to a few um, local players uh, about how that might be best used. So that will be, uh, will that be uh, like a, a cinema theater or a live performances? Or, or It seems much more likely that it would be live performance yeah. um, and maybe with some community element. But the, as I mentioned, the a lot of the theaters got hit pretty hard during COVID, so yeah, we're, yeah, of course. We're, um, of course. we're not sure yet how they're going to operationalize it and what they're going to do with it, but that seems likely. Yeah. So you expect if you close in November, you expect construction to... So has anything been done there yet? Any demo, uh, demolition? No. Anything? No. no. Okay. They're cleaning the building out now, yeah. um, and so uh, it won't be... So it will take all of next year, certainly, for construction, uh, so it won't be occupied until sometime in 24. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So let, let's let's get back to to the Hamilton Road uh, uh, or the Hamilton project, uh, uh, and um, uh, we have an image here of the groundbreaking that took past the part oh, yeah. uh, uh, this past uh, um, June. Tell us what's happening there. You know, you're on the uh, far left hand side. So yeah. tell us what was <laughs> happening there. Yeah, that's the ceremonial groundbreaking for the the project there. So we had some um, supporters and donors and um, people excited about kicking off that project. Join us for for that day. Yeah, and that's on. And let's let's show the the next image here. This is this will be a, a kind of a blueprint of what. So tell us again. You you were mentioning earlier. Tell us about these uh, five. Uh, five uh, units. They're 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 each a duplex. Is that right? Tell us yeah. what we're looking at here. Yeah. So that it's going to be five buildings. Each building is a duplex. So the first two buildings are one bedroom. So there's going to be four one bedroom. Um, the middle building is two bedrooms. So that'll be two two bedroom units. And then the back two buildings are three bedroom units. So um, the phase one of this is actually going to be buildings three and four. So it'll be two bedroom and three bedroom that, that will be, actually the silt fence should be going in next week. So, and trees coming down next week. So that'll okay. be um, starting then. Yeah. No, cause I, I drive down Asbury, that's Asbury Road there. That would be the line across the bottom. I drive past it all the time when I go out to the parks with my dogs. I was looking for any sign of anything going right, on yet. Right, right. Uh, but we, like everybody, we've had a little bit of staffing yeah. shortage over the past few months, but that has been resolved, so we are getting back to work there. Um, and for people who drive down Asbury Street, it's directly across from the Canterbrook development. Right, that, that, was a, that used to be a horse farm there, yes. and, and they, that's been, been uh, developed there. Yeah. Yes. And now, have you already got your residence uh, uh, already? Has the lottery, so, is that done? You, every, no, no, so gotcha. right now we're in the middle of that process. So we had 39 initial applicants. And then our family selection committee goes out and visits each of the applicants in their homes over the next month or so. And then our board will vote to include them in the lottery um, in December. And so by Christmas, we will have chosen the families for okay. the first four homes. Yeah. And you were mentioning that, that these, these, each of these units will be priced around the 200000 and now what, what would that be if you were to take a guess? What would that be if, the, if you were to sell these at market rates? What would those things go for? Oh, goodness. I, I, I'm not a real estate, <laughs> a market rate real estate yeah, expert, yeah. but I, you know, I can tell you that some least, of our more recent homes have appraised around 400,000 yeah, to four to 500,000. Yeah, at least, at least yeah. two, two and a half times uh, yeah. that. So that's a quite a, a uh, affordable housing. Well, um, Let's talk about, there was a project that, that I've read about in the paper that, Andrew, you're involved in at uh, Gordon-Conwell Seminary. This isn't Gordon College. Right. This is Gordon-Conwell Seminary. And uh, they, through COVID, and essentially they're, they're moving their, 
their headquarters into the into Boston, and they're going to do a lot of um, virtual learning as, as as opposed to campus. So, you've put in a a, a bid, an offer on uh, on uh, the, the the six big, uh, what I would resident residential buildings and and uh, and campus buildings there. Tell tell us where that stands. So. Sure. Well, yeah, so we have two projects going in Hamilton at the moment. One is just close by to where Megan is, um, just up the street. That's Asbury Common, which is a 45-unit building. We're permitting that right now. And then the second one is what you mentioned, which is we had site control of six apartment buildings on Gordon Conwell's campus. That was 210 apartments, um, ones and twos and three-bedroom apartments that they use generally to house their, their usually married students. Yeah. Um, their model is changing, as you mentioned, uh, and so they they were not having as much use for those. So we had site control of that for an extended period of time until uh, about last week or so, uh, and had started the process with the town. Um, the town and the seminary, uh, after um, we had started that process, had a discussion about the balance of their campus, which is about 100 acres. Um, and so what they asked for, both the town and the school, is they... Um, have decided to engage a planning process for the entire campus. Uh, and so we um, relinquished our agreement while they go through that process. And then hopefully we'll be able to come back in and, back in and participate uh -huh. uh, based on what they decide to do with the overall campus. Um, so we'll see. Okay, so right now that's kind of on, on hold until the city and Gordon uh, decides what the, how they want the overall picture of, right. uh, of, the, of the thing. Yeah. Now, um, Talking about um, affordable housing in, in general, I, we know with, uh, with skyrocketing real estate prices and now with supply chain problems and, and so forth, have you found what you do uh, more difficult here in the last couple of years and, and how, are you, how are you managing that, Megan? Yeah, so I would say there have been different challenges over the past couple of years, but not necessarily um, new challenges. The Certainly the, the cost of the inflation has been a, a factor for us. The cost of lumber has been a real factor for us. Um, some of the staffing challenges that I mentioned have been a, a, a real um, factor for us. Um, but we're beginning to see some of that turning. So the, the price of lumber is actually starting to come down. We are fully staffed again at this point. So um, that is, th that's progress in those areas. Yeah. 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 Andrew? Yeah, definitely cost and interest rate, uh, to make its point, have made deals more difficult. Um, I think what I would say, though, that it's good for people, especially at home, to know is it's not, it's actually the construction of the buildings is not the hardest part. Um, it is in our experience. It is the you know the regulatory environment um, of permitting, uh, especially locally, and then the financing, which is incredibly complex at the state level. Those processes are very time consuming, very expensive, um, and take an extended amount of time. And so it could take us, for example, you know three or four years to get something designed and permitted and funded, uh, and a year and a half to build. Right, yeah. so it's it's faster yeah. to build it than it yeah, is, to, it is to, to do all of the to do all the paper other and administrative work. Correct, yeah. which is extensive, very yeah. significant. Yeah. Now, is it fair to ask you, compared to other areas of the country, in New England here where we are, how how is it harder to deal with to develop affordable housing here, or are there other places where it's easier, or more or more difficult, or is that a not not a fair question to you? Um, so I haven't developed affordable housing elsewhere, but I can tell you from talking with my colleagues around the country, um, Massachusetts has one of the uh, most highly regulated and most um, complex permitting processes of, of any area of the country. Yeah. Um, at Essex County Habitat, we work in 34 cities and towns, and yeah. there are 34 different, different local yeah, sets of processes regulations, yeah. and local yeah. decision makers, and you know some of that is a great thing, but it, it does add a whole lot of complexity and a whole lot of time and cost yeah. to um, the pro yeah. development of affordable yeah. housing. Well, we're, we're almost out of time. What I'm going to do now at the end is I want to I want to put up your your uh, websites so that if people want to have get more information, they want to contact you. Let's uh, let's put up the first one, uh, if we could, Robert. <clears throat> so this is okay. This is you, uh, Andrew Harborlight Community Partners dot org, and um, uh, 
you, that's your website, and people can can uh, go on there and find out what you do and sure. so on and so on and so forth. Happy to have them. Yeah, and um, uh, the, the other one, so Essex County Habitat. There. Now, uh, Megan, you 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 you're always looking for volunteers, right, to to, to help out. Yes. Right. Yep. So, so if, if there's a way so people can get on this website and they can find out how they can volunteer. Absolutely. And, and, yep. and so on and so on. Now, Andre, do you do you look very very much for volunteers or not? Or most people are paid and you deal with the. Yeah, not so much on the volunteer side. We we will occasionally have volunteer groups that'll come in and run events. You know, especially at some of the elderly buildings, and that's generally very well received. Yeah. Um, so that's more on the volunteer side. We are always looking for volunteers who would be advocates at the local level during permitting. That is incredibly valuable, yeah. um, and that's where we like to see people's energy. Okay, very good. Well, um, it's been a pleasure having you folks on. I, my guest today, Megan O'Neill, who is the Essex County Executive Director of Habitat for Humanity, and Andrew DeFranza, who is the Executive Director of Harbor Lake Community Partners. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. And I'd like to remind our viewers that you've been watching North Shore Journal. I'm your host, Walt Kosmowski. And we'll see you next time.